Hey everybody, Helm Developer Call on April 1st, April Fool's Day. Um, let's see, for today we have a few announcements. Um, the renaming of the main branch. Uh, looks like Martin's not on here. Yeah, I um, put that for Martin, but I guess we could wait for him. Hopefully he'll show up. There he is. Speaking of Martin, right on time. Hello, folks. Uh, Martin, we were just talking about the branch rename. So did you want to mention something about that? Uh, did Was there a storm or anything? <laughs> no trouble? <laughs> Yeah. No, I, ju I just took the liberty of putting it on the, the announcement list and thank you for doing it. Okay, so shout out to uh, John, a uh, community member that, that raised this last year. And um, all that happened there really was we were just waiting on GitHub to streamline it. And um, then I'd say we kind of forgot about it in January. So um, yeah, it's good, good to get that sorted out. Uh, this shouldn't be any big issues for anyone in the sense that GitHub does most of the redirection and stuff like that. And uh, it's just that you need to sort out your clone. And I put in, I put in a post into the, um, the Helm channel, channels, Slack channels. So the info should be there for you. So it's important to just run those few commands because if you do a pull or whatever, rebase, it's, it's not going to pick up the latest for you, basically, if you, if you don't have done that. So, yeah. And when you go to GitHub, uh, because of the change, it pops up and it tells you right there the first time you go over to the repository what you need to do and gives you the commands. So that's why I knew you had finally pulled the, the trigger because when I went to the site this morning, it told me, run these commands. I did it and it worked flawlessly. Yeah, I did the same thing happened for me as well. But if you're like one of me and you click something and suddenly it disappears, you may not get that. And for some reason, the doc is slightly, it's missing one of the commands about, um, going back to the head for some odd reason. Um, so um, yeah, so if you, if you, yeah. So it's at least it's in the Slack channel and someone can pick that up, so yeah. Okay, yeah, and that's pinned, so it should show up for people. Mm -hmm. So are we gonna take an action item to go around and clean it up in all the uh, non-Helm Helm repos? I'll have to make some Netlify changes on www, for example, when we do that one. Yeah, I think that's, I think what we said on the, on the mailing list was that we're going to do it on, you know, the maintainers on that particular one. I, I, I did the two to three, all right. Um, um, so, yeah, I think it's going to be on a, 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 a I suppose, a maintainer, a maintainer basis. Sounds uh, good. Uh, okay, and then also the archiving of Monocular. So everything went uh, through governance-wise to archive Monocular. Um, so I'll probably go through that process, maybe even tomorrow to do it. I'll probably craft up a blog post that says use Artifact Hub instead of Monocular, just so people know that positive path forward. Um, but otherwise, everything's in, everything approved to archive it, so. And the last announcement is for the contributor summit. Brina, did you wanna talk to that? I just, I just like the reminder because it's a next Tuesday. I mean, all the days are blurring together and I feel like it's gonna be August and I'll have missed two conferences and forgot, so yeah. Exactly. <laughs> okay, and that's all the announcements um, for discussions, Brina, the dependency update flag. Yeah, so uh, I started looking through the history of the dependency update flag when you're running something like Helm install. And it says it will update to the latest dependencies, but it turns out that it doesn't do that. It only kicks in if you're missing charts in the charts directory that you have in the dependencies folder. So if everything's there and you put the flag on it, it doesn't do anything. And this issue gets into different variations of ways that this can bite you. But basically the documentation is different from how it works. And I think it just had to do with the way these features were layered in um, over time back in the two cycle, like around two, seven, two, eight, two, nine. It just didn't all come together as cleanly and everything's carried along since then. 
And so the question is, and, and I would say it's a bug because the documentation doesn't match the feature. So something needs to be updated. My take on it is because it's been this way for so long that we, um, we probably need to just update the documentation to say that this only updates in that case and probably need to, for people who want to update no matter what, add a second flag that says update dependencies for reals. Um, really not that flag name, but something like that, that will, as long as you have that flag, it'll really update. And then we'll have to have a note to clean this up in Helm 4. But I wanted some other thoughts on it. But what's the actual behavior on it? The actual behavior is that uh, it looks to make sure that the, the number of charts in the charts directory are the same as the number of charts you list in your dependencies. And if those aren't the same, then it runs an update if you have the flag. Okay, so the behavior now is more like a sync to what's defined? Uh, no, because it's not looking at your lock file to pull it in. It's actually running an update. <laughs> so it's kind of an ugly mess. It's not okay. doing what we would like, but backwards compatibility, you know. Um, you can see the code in, which file is this? In install.go, probably in up, upgrade.go too. Uh, it's at line 216. There's a link in here. Let me just drop the, if you want to quickly get to the code to discuss it, here you go. And it starts off with action check dependencies. And action check dependencies um, checks to see the dependencies in the chart and it's looking for missing dependencies. And so it just returns if there are missing dependencies or not. Right? And there's a difference between upgrade my things or update my things as the flag says and missing dependencies. And these came in as two separate pull requests that were um, unrelated. And I think it was how they both came together very quickly over time, but um, it didn't come together cleanly. Yeah, that one's tricky because if it's not operating um, as intended and as documented, that to me reads like a bug. And the behavior should match the intention. And we've had this problem since Helm 2.9. So it's either a bug that's carried on since 2.9 with the behavior people. And so this is where I'm stuck on, uh, which is the best way to move forward on this. If it's a load bearing bug that people have built their lives around, do we have to give them a flag to keep the bug behavior? If we take the bug behavior away, if we fix the glitch, are people going to be upset? And this is why I brought it to this call. Dr. Butcher, I see you have joined us. So quietly sitting in the background. How much of this have you heard? Oh, none of it. Also, I'm distracted because my camera's broken. Okay, so uh, what's going on here is if you look at um, the meeting for today, there was the one where the dependency update flag, it's docs say that it'll update the dependencies if you pass it in, but it only ever updates things if you uh, have missing dependencies. So you have to have missing dependencies and pass in the flag before it does a dependencies update. And this is on install. Yeah. And it says it'll just update it, but really it only does it. And these were two separate pull requests for separate features that came in um, around the same time. I think one landed in 2.7, one landed in 2.9. And so they were around each other. And they came in and they didn't come in all that cleanly for this to happen. Um, so I'm not sure whether this is something we fix as a bug. And the document, you know, because the documentation is a little different from the 
functionality on it. So what's the right way to handle this? So if we change it, the result is going to be that a lot of people who have not seen things update during CI workflows and things like that are suddenly going to see a whole bunch of things update, right? Yes, so if they're using that, the flag. That would, be, that would be surprising, possibly dangerous, because a pipeline that was, that was item potent for some amount of time will suddenly not be, if that makes sense. But I also agree with Adam that this does sound like a bug. <laughs> this yeah, also, I, I, see this, I, I see this as being more of like an interactive command, like the use of it. Um, it's probably not heavily used heavily. I'm, I'm just guessing here. But I would assume that it's not used in CI pipelines very often. It's going to modify your chart behavior anyway. Um, you're going to get unexpected results running it as is if you're saying, oh, give me stuff that's missing. Um, that's a really good point because we don't want to surprise people in a sad, unfortunate way, but also they might already be experiencing such surprises. Yeah, because it's already like I'm going from my known state to an unknown one because I'm just saying update and give me all the dependencies I don't have. So my chart is already going to uh, behave in a way that could be unexpected. Is it okay to pleasantly surprise? Lots of some people might take something as a pleasant surprise. Well, somebody mm -hmm. else might take the same surprise as a what did you do to me surprise? People get very emotionally attached to the load-bearing bugs. So I don't have enough data to know. I mean, searching for this flag on GitHub to see its use just gives you one point, but that's only going to give you a little bit. And I don't see much to that flag, quite frankly, in here. But it's hard to search for flags on GitHub. So... Um, what do you all think? For, for sure, I wouldn't want to do it in a patch release. I, I think we'd want to do it in a minor release just because that people at least expect breakages. But I'm not opposed to doing, to fixing this. I th I, I'm, you know, a little in and out here, but just to throw an opinion out there, I think there's two bits to this. Number one is you want to remove the behavior of an old flag that doesn't do what a naive user would expect. Then you also want to add two different behaviors. One of them might be update everything to latest and the other one might be update uh, uh, something more like add things that are missing but don't update things that are present. And so, you know, I think maybe the thing is you deprecate the old flag and put it through a deprecation process and you come up with two new flags to do the two behaviors. And that way, the people who are using the old behavior of the old flag, they'll get an error. They won't get a, a behavior they don't expect eventually when that deprecation goes all the way through. So I like the idea of the two flags. What I'm wondering about is the deprecation cycle. What would that look like? Do we have a defined deprecation cycle? No, not that I know of. It, is there anything built into Semver for that? For deprecation? For Semver, I mean, to be strictly Semver compliant, Helm v4. And we could I'm, do that. We could I'm do that. I'm inclined to say that's the right time to do it. Um, yeah, it kind of sucks that you have this flag that doesn't do what you expect. But in the meantime, you just document. You can add the two new flags so that people can start migrating to the new behavior. Yeah. And then you just say, when Helm v4 drops at whatever time in the indefinite future that is, this flag will go away. OK. That, that all sounds good to me. I can document the ticket to uh, to take that into account. Sounds good. We can go on to the next one then.
I like that idea, Joe. Thanks. Yeah, no sweat. Okay, and then um, Mark has um, wants to talk about a hip uh, cherry pick PR. Yeah, so we have hip ten. Um, Butcher and Farina commented on it. Um, basically, it's I summed it up with a new title, which is basically it, it's proposing that we cherry pick a PR into the release branch right after it's merged into master. So I just wanted to bring it up. Fisher's not here. He had some concerns. So I'm not sure if we should postpone this or what you guys think. It's really about making it easier for the release manager. So if the release manager doesn't think it's a good idea, I don't want to push this. So the, the, Oh, do you want to address this one? I was going to talk about the security process, Matt. Go ahead, Matt. Okay. So the one the one outlier we walked through that Farina and I Farina and I did, went and did a hip review last week, um, and just reviewed all of the outstanding ones. And this one was interesting because uh, uh, the security process was originally built around the older process, and the older and the newer process you proposed is better. We just had to figure out how to handle the security patch case. So we think that the solution would be, whereas normally we've cut the security releases off of the patch branch, uh, we would have to go back to the last tag and then create a branch off that tag and apply the security release to that branch and then tag that so that we didn't accidentally release a security release that had patches that were actually intended for the next patch release. So it's slightly more work for the security one, but given the infrequency of security patches and the frequency of patch releases, that seems like the right trade-off to make. Uh, and also, you know, with the security ones, we tend to go very rigorously through the process. So adding a couple more steps to the process isn't really that bad. Uh, it feel, in other words, it feels like the right place to put extra burden. Um, so that was our only, that, that was the only hiccup I remember seeing as we read through that hip and we did spend a pretty good amount of time talking through it. Was there anything else you wanted to add to that, Farina? No, that sounds great. Yeah. Okay. So first, thanks for clarifying the security thing. I hadn't quite clicked on how the process usually works. So now I understand. I can add a, I guess, a, a, a note for, or a section for how to handle uh, the security patch. Um, Fisher had brought up in the comments that sometimes uh, when there's a Kubernetes release, then uh, conflicts are always the same. You want to merge one PR and it, there's always the same kind of merge conflicts because they're all coming from Kubernetes. And he was worried that then we would be delegating the same merge conflict resolution to multiple people instead of having one release manager do them all at the same time. I, I don't know, never dealt with it. So I don't know if Farina or uh, Adam or, or Butcher, you guys have an opinion on, or Martin, if you, you know, for those I've done releases, if, if you think that's uh, something of concern or, or not, I wish Fisher was here. Yeah, so when it comes to the, the merge conflicts, it's usually all about when it's being cherry picked. Um, and then you have to understand the, the pull request. I mean, it's when you cherry pick something, it has trouble bringing it in is usually what I encounter. Um, and then you've got to go learn and understand the order of the pull request that came in, things like that. It's probably easier for the person who reviewed it to do it because if they reviewed it, they should hopefully understand what they reviewed. Um, and be in the breath of mind where they just dealt with it and have an easier time with it. Um, and doing it with a new pull request would let it go through tests and everything. Now, when it comes to something like the Kubernetes bits, we haven't been using um, Dependabot to do that because things get really confusing. If you update one Kubernetes dependent library at a time, next thing you get this thing where you've got multiple patch releases of things and everything's weird as you do it. And so we normally just ignore Dependabot. And when one comes in, we go do one that updates everything across the board. And that's usually a pretty clean experience then, um, even for cherry picking in. So I'm not sure about the Kubernetes issues, at least as of late. Okay, well, uh, I guess, could you, could you, would you mind commenting or? 
Yeah, I don't feel, I don't I don't feel comment comfortable on that today. pushing on this without, you know, going against what Fisher was concerned about. Yeah, today or tomorrow, I'll, I'll comment on it um, with some feedback. So I'll just update the, the HIP as you guys suggested for the security patch. And then whenever you, if you, if you want to approve it, then it's great. And then we can, I guess it has to be communicated to all the maintainers that basically you approve a PR, you merge a PR and master, go do it in the release branch at the same time. Fundamentally. That's it. Thank you. Okay. And sorry, my internet cut out there for a second. So I missed some of that. Um, let's see, next up, we have Rena with uh, chart cache. So um, what I was looking at, and there's a linked issue off of it. If you look at how we handle, we cache index files locally, right, for repositories. And it turns out we actually take a copy of the chart and stick it into that same cache directory. So if you go install Bitnami WordPress and it grabs a version, you'll have a WordPress-sember.tgz file sitting in that same directory. Now we never use it. We can't use it, right? Because I could get it from WordPress and I could get it from somebody else with the same name and same version, but they wouldn't be the same chart. So sticking it in there is kind of just like a waste of space that we can never really use because you don't know if it's the same thing content wise. And so uh, it would be nice if we're going to have a cache to actually cache it well and use it. So what struck me as an idea, and there's an issue there, is to use, uh, make it a content addressable cache. Um, they, there's code out of Go because Go has a content addressable cache now in it. And somebody exported that into a library we could use. And then you basically take charts, you use their digest as the location, and then you could store the, it as a content addressable cache. And if it's in the cache, just install it from there rather than download it each time. So that's the idea. Um, and I was wondering what folks think of that. Crickets, lovely. Uh, the, the way to, to probably ID on it, and I'm not sure if this would cause any issues, is in the index.yaml file, you have a digest for each thing. You could use that digest to go look it up in the cache. So you would never even have to hit the network in order to install something you have in your cache. That does mean that if you did not update your index.yaml file and you updated the package in that uh, Helm repository, you wouldn't download the newer version because it wouldn't see the new digest. That's the only gotcha there. So we'd probably want to flag to skip the caching, but what do y'all think? I am curious if this makes a difference. We've talked before about um, how much disk space or you know how much data uh, bandwidth is taken up by transferring all this stuff. And I'm wondering if we start affecting what gets cached and what doesn't, if that is going to be relevant to that discussion. Well, most of that discussion was about the Helm binary downloads, and this does nothing to help with that because uh, that's where our, our previous things have been. Um, in the past, when we had the charge repository, it definitely would have impacted that. Um, for people installing that, that would have reduced the bandwidth over to there. Um, I, I don't know what the impact to folks would be on this, but it's one of the things we were we were looking at just to continually use the local cache. I mean, if somebody had Helm doing it in your CI, you could keep that cache directory, and then your CI isn't always reaching out to install things too. Although your cache directory would slowly grow, um, but that happens locally anyway now. Yeah, the, the only other thing I could... No, I mean, every use case I can think of where where some automation would have a growing cache. Yeah. Generally, they're all throwaway. Yeah, I mean, we, we store it now anyway. So it would just be utilizing the cache. Um, so right now, it's just wait to space. So yeah. Some sort of a, some sort of way of cleaning out expired you know some sort of a timeout method would be would be nice yeah we need some way to to clean the cash or prune the cash um yeah that's pretty doable though 
Does the idea sound like a good one? Yes. I would say yeah. in general, yes. I mean, just since no one has piped up exactly, or not a lot, but you know, I, the, the, digest, the digest piece censors it for me. You know, we're, we're being safe about, about what we're doing. We've, we've got, um, you know, there's no mistake. If, for example, if there are rolling, if there are, were changes in the YAML file, you know what I mean, the index.yaml. Um, okay. Oh, Matt, there is one question I have. Um, the default behavior for when the digest changes, we just simply wipe the cache for that. I mean, if the digest changes, when you go look it up in the cache, it just wouldn't be there. So you'd have to get the new one and have the new cache entry for the digest. The old yeah. one would still be there. And if somebody wanted to hit that for something else, you'd be able to hit it for something else. It's true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. I was just thinking about the, the, the fun thing that Vic did uh, for the <laughs> stable. Yeah. And, and here I was just thinking about if you make it a content addressable cache, then even if you have the same chart in five different repositories, you only have one cache entry because it's the same piece of data. Okay. okay. Um, and, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say we only have a few minutes and one item left. So do we want to? Yeah, go ahead and jump to that. Switch over to that. Okay. Um, investigate artifact signing. Uh, Karina again. So I put this in here not to really talk about it in this this session, um, but if you want to look at it, I can always ask one of the maintainers to come. I just I thought it was interesting. It's signing, you know, your artifacts, and you know, Kubernetes does a poor job of signing in general. So just thought that might be interesting to look at. You know, maybe not now or for Helm four or even Artifact Hub, but. Anyway, I just wanted to put it out there. Yeah, and so this is interesting. Um, there is a, I wanna look at the, the difference in the projects. So I've looked at uh, Tough and Intoto, right? Intoto is for your software supply chain leading up to distribution. Tough is for your distribution. Um, we have long and helmed used PGP. So Helm itself as a binary you fetch, uh, you can PGP verify that package you get from us. Um, we do that in every release. And then Helm itself has uh, provenance files, which are PGP signed, and Helm has built in signing and validation features for that. We had looked at the write ahead log by, um, oh, Butcher, do you remember who did, did the log for uh, the public log of things you could write to? Uh, <clears throat> Brandon Phillips, and also there's okay. SigStore, which we've also looked at. Okay, Th this is for SigStore that's presented here. Do you know much about it? Are you asking me? Yeah. Uh, I, I, I wouldn't say I know much about it. I know about it and how it functions and the design. Yeah. And it does the same kind of thing as Brandon Phillips's project did. Okay. Yeah. Largely, it, it, I guess the question is where we, where we store the signatures because we have a signature algorithm. Nobody uses it, but it's there. Uh, and we have OCI tough support if we need. And we have... Uh, hashing on our binaries when we release. We just, you know, what, what people do with it from there has been undefined since uh, we introduced it in Helm 2. Yeah. So I'll take an action because I'm curious about the security stuff and SIG Store is a Linux Foundation project. So I'll go, I'll, I'll be willing to go read up on it and learn about it. It is really alpha, but it wouldn't be a bad thing to at least get in on it on the ground floor. Yeah, and, and even if we have feedback for them, um, I probably wouldn't want to use it if it's not stable, uh, because that means they're changing their design, which is hard on Helm, um, unless we did it as an experimental feature. But I do want to understand how it works. Okay, and we're at time. And um, does anybody want to volunteer for triage next week?
Adam, I'll do it with you if you help me with it. I'll do it with you. Okay. okay. And that's a wrap. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.